Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Learning Stethoscope. In today's video, we're diving into a really fascinating and clinically important topic, nerve injury and nerve regeneration. First, let's start with some anatomy of the nervous system. The brain and spinal cord together make up the central nervous system. If we take a cross-section on the spinal cord, we can see the gray and white matter. From the spinal cord, two roots branch out. The dorsal root, which carries sensory information into the spinal cord, and the ventral root, which carries motor commands out to the body. These two roots join together to form the spinal nerve. That means each spinal nerve is a mixed nerve, carrying both sensory and motor signals, before branching out to innervate the skin, muscles, and internal organs. Now, the spinal nerve is part of the peripheral nervous system, and if we take a cross-section, we can see not only nerve fibers, but also blood vessels that support them. Structurally, spinal nerves are organized and protected by three layers of connective tissue. And this organization isn't just for support, it's also key for how nerves respond to injury and regeneration. The outermost layer is the epineurium, which holds the entire nerve together. Inside the nerve, fibers are grouped into bundles called fascicles, and each fascicle is surrounded by the perineurium, the second layer of connective tissue. Finally, within each fascicle, every individual axon is wrapped around by the endoneurium. Depending on their function, these axons can be myelinated, which makes conduction much faster, or unmyelinated, which conduct more slowly. Let's zoom in on the neuron itself. A neuron is the basic functional unit of the nervous system. It has a cell body, which contains the nucleus and the metabolic machinery that keeps the cell alive. Extending from the cell body are the dendrites, short branch-like structures that receive incoming signals from other neurons. From there, we have the axon, a long projection that carries electrical signals away from the cell body. Axons can be very short or extremely long. In fact, some can run the entire length of a limb. At the end of the axon are the axon terminals, where neurotransmitters are released to communicate with the next cell, whether that's another neuron, a muscle fiber, or a gland. In the peripheral nervous system, many axons are wrapped in myelin, which is produced by Schwann cells. Myelin acts like insulation on a wire, allowing electrical signals to travel much faster and more efficiently along the axon. And surrounding each individual axon, whether myelinated or not, there is a delicate layer of connective tissue called the endoneurium, which provides support and protection. Now that we've covered the anatomy, let's talk about the mechanisms of nerve injury. In other words, how nerves actually get damaged. The first and one of the most common causes is compression. This happens when something presses on a nerve, like a herniated disc pressing on a spinal nerve root or prolonged pressure on a peripheral nerve during surgery, or even from poor posture. Compression reduces blood flow to the nerve and can cause temporary or permanent dysfunction, depending on how severe and long-lasting it is. Second, we have stretch injuries, also called traction injuries. Nerves are somewhat elastic, but if they're stretched beyond about 20% of their length, the axons and even the connective tissue layers can tear. A classic example is a shoulder dislocation, which can stretch and injure the axillary nerve. Third, there's laceration or transection, which is when the nerve is cut, for example by a knife wound, glass, or surgical injury. This is the most severe form of injury because the axon continuity is completely disrupted. Whether regeneration is possible depends on whether the connective tissue framework of the nerve is preserved. Fourth. Another important mechanism is ischemia, meaning loss of blood supply. Just like any other tissue, nerves need oxygen and nutrients delivered by small blood vessels called the vasa nervorum. When blood flow is interrupted, for example, due to trauma, vascular disease, or compartment syndrome, the nerve fibers suffer. And finally, there's the crush injury. Here, the nerve is compressed and squashed with significant force, for example, by a heavy object or machinery accident. Now, let's take a look at what happens on a microscopic level when a neuron is damaged. And more importantly, how do we actually classify the severity of these injuries? 
Not all nerve damage is the same, and the way a nerve heals depends a lot on the extent of the injury. There are several nerve injury classification systems. One of the first and simplest was described by Seddon in 1943. It divides nerve injuries into three main types, from the mildest to the most severe. So, here we start with a normal healthy neuron that has been injured. The first level is neuropraxia. This is the mildest type of injury. In neuropraxia, the endoneurium remains intact, the axon remains intact, but there is some damage to the myelin sheath, leading to a temporary conduction block. This often happens with compression injuries. The good news? Recovery is usually complete and fairly quick, often within days to weeks once the compression is relieved. The second level is axonotmesis. Here, the endoneurium is still intact, but the axon itself is damaged and the myelin is also damaged. Since the endoneurium is intact, provides a guiding path for regenerating axons to grow back toward their targets. In this case, the distal end of the neuron will die, meaning that it will degenerate while the proximal stump will start to regenerate. In axonotmesis, recovery is possible, but much slower than neuropraxia, because the axon has to regrow from the site of injury all the way back to its target muscle or skin area. Finally, the third level is neurotmesis. This is the most severe form. In neurotmesis, everything is disrupted. The endoneurium, the axon, and myelin are damaged. Essentially, the nerve is completely cut. Without surgical repair, regenerating axons have no path to follow, so recovery is extremely poor. Even with surgery, full recovery is often incomplete, and the prognosis is usually unfavorable. Now, what happens if an axon is cut or severely damaged? We can divide the changes into what happens in the proximal segment and what happens in the distal segment. In the proximal segment, the part of the axon that's still attached to the cell body, Survival is usually possible since it can still get nutrients and support from the neuron soma. But the part of the axon closest to the injury, usually just one or two nodes of Ranvier near the cut, undergoes some degeneration. This is called retrograde degeneration. Meanwhile, the cell body itself shows reactive changes in a process known as chromatolysis. During chromatolysis, the cell body swells, the nucleus shifts to the periphery, and the nicele bodies, which are clusters of rough endoplasmic reticulum, disperse. This reflects a big increase in protein synthesis, and these proteins are transported down into the axon to support regeneration and repair. Essentially, the neuron is switching into repair mode, ramping up protein synthesis and resources in an attempt to regrow the injured axon. In the distal segment, here's what happens step by step. Once the axon is cut, the distal portion loses all contact with the neuron's cell body. Without proteins and energy from the soma, it quickly begins to break down. Within 24 to 48 hours, the distal axon starts to fragment. This is axonal degeneration, and the myelin sheath around it also disintegrates. But the Schwann cells don't just sit still. They line up along the path of the old axon, forming what's called the bands of Bungner. You can think of these like guiding tunnels for regrowing axons. At the same time, the endoneurium releases chemical signals that attract macrophages, which move in and clear away the debris of axons and myelin. Together, the changes in both the proximal and distal segments are called Wallerian degeneration. So, after Wallerian degeneration, the regeneration process begins. Remember how the proximal segment switched into repair mode with the nucleus ramping up protein production? Well, those proteins are transported down the axon to fuel regrowth. From the proximal stump, tiny axon sprouts begin to emerge. Not all of them make it, but the ones that find the Schwann cell tunnels, those bands of Bungner we talked about, get the guidance they need to keep growing in the right direction. These sprouts slowly extend toward their original targets, whether that's a muscle fiber or a sensory receptor in the skin. As the sprouts advance, Schwann cells wrap around them and begin producing new myelin. This remyelination restores the ability to conduct electrical signals efficiently. 
If all goes well, the axon eventually reconnects with its target organ. Once the connection is re-established, the neuron gradually shifts back to its normal state. The nucleus moves back to the center. Protein production stabilizes and function is restored. How long does this process take? Well, regeneration usually starts within a few days to one week after the injury. On average, peripheral axons regrow at about 1 to 3 millimeters per day. So, this means that recovery depends heavily on the distance between the site of injury and the target muscle or skin. If the injury is close to the target muscle or skin, say a finger nerve, regeneration might reconnect in weeks to a few months. If the injury is further away, for example, a nerve injured at the arm that must regenerate all the way to the hand, it can take many months, sometimes even a year or more, or maybe incomplete. But here's the thing. Even when the axons finally reconnect, recovery doesn't happen overnight. The neuromuscular junctions need to rebuild, and the muscles or sensory receptors need some time to wake up and start working again. Muscles in particular don't wait forever. If they remain denervated too long, usually greater than 12 to 18 months, they can undergo permanent atrophy and fibrosis. And once that happens, even if the nerve eventually reaches them, the recovery will be very limited. And that's a wrap on nerve injury and regeneration. I hope this helped you understand how nerves heal and what factors affect recovery. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to The Learning Stethoscope for more medical videos. Drop a comment and let me know what topic you'd like me to cover next. Stay curious and see you in the next video.